May I move swiftly on to Professor Karen Smith for your observations, remarks, and any recommendations you can share with us. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm impressed that everyone is still here and, and, and awake this, this late uh, in the afternoon. Um, and it's obviously because of the importance of this, this meeting that we're having here today. Uh, and I appreciate you all being here. And I'd also just like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this very important event. Um, it's really been sobering for me today to listen to the testimonies of survivors and family members of victims. Um, and it was very clear that even after 35 years, the pain does not go away. Um, and while we've heard different figures today about the number of executions, these individual stories are what make these numbers come alive. Um, now, justice and redress take many forms, and I strongly believe that events like the one held today, which gives people a platform to tell their stories, uh, plays a really important part in the broader quest for justice. I also say this drawing on my own experience of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission process, where public hearings were held across the country and broadcast daily across various forms of media. Not only did this allow people to share their experiences of gross violations of human rights, it also meant that nobody in the country or internationally could say, could continue to say that they didn't know what happened or that they didn't realize how violent the apartheid state had been. Um, now, I'm not an international lawyer, and so I will limit my comments on legal matters. Uh, luckily, I have a number of uh, learned colleagues on the panel with me, so I'll leave that to them. Um, what is clear to me, however, as someone who's not a lawyer, is that we heard plenty of evidence today. Um, and of course, that also includes some of the documentation that's publicly available to substantiate claims of crimes against humanity having been committed in Iran in 1988. Now, while holding those responsible for committing these crimes is a matter of principle and something that is owed to the victims and their families, it is also significant in terms of the broader cycle of human rights violations, which may account uh, to atrocity crimes, their recurrence and their prevention. And a number of speakers have pointed this out today, but I wanted to really emphasize this because we know from evidence-based research that the risk of recurrence of atrocity crimes is significantly higher in contexts where accountability for previous crimes has not been achieved. And in the United Nations framework of analysis for atrocity crimes, which is used by the, the office in which I serve, the Office of the Special Advisor for Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect, in assessing at risk, uh, countries at risk of, of atrocities, a history of atrocity crimes combined with a record of impunity and weak state structures are among the core risk factors. We know, and we've heard a number of times today, that impunity breeds a culture of impunity, what some have referred to as systematic or structural impunity. And we've seen this in the increased violent repression of protesters and human rights defenders in Iran over the past few years and continuing as we speak. I also want to emphasize again that although today's events focus on the year 1988, as we've heard from some of the survivors and family members, the arrests, torture, and some of the executions already started earlier, uh, including from 1981 onwards, and obviously continued after that uh, fact as well. And this underlines the point that we are dealing with, what, what we're dealing with here constitutes ongoing crimes against humanity. I now want to turn to the responsibilities of states to protect populations from and to prevent the commission of atrocity crimes and when I say atrocity crimes, I'm referring to the four crimes of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, which I think is particularly uh, pertinent in this case, and also ethnic cleansing. And of course, these all fall under the responsibility to protect principle, which was, uh, I'll remind you, unanimously adopted by all states, including Iran, uh, at the 2005 World Summit. Now, while this means that Iran has the primary responsibility to protect its populations from such atrocities, and this includes taking measures to lower the risk of atrocity crimes, one of which is ensuring that the perpetrators of previous atrocity crimes are held to account and that justice is served, um, we also know that in light of recent and current events in Iran and the history of impunity, it's clear that Iran is not upholding its responsibility. So under the responsibility to protect, this responsibility then falls on the international community, 
which has a collective legal, moral and political duty to prevent the commission and recurrence of atrocity crimes. In his 2017 report to the General Assembly on the responsibility to protect, the UN Secretary General emphasized the importance of uh, strengthening accountability for the prevention of mass atrocity crimes. Now, while legal accountability relates to obligations under national and international law, accountability for implementation of the responsibility to protect, however, goes beyond legal obligations and includes a moral and a political dimension. Now, while the Human Rights Council has heeded calls by civil society to establish a fact-finding mission into the state-led human rights violations in Iran during and following the 20, uh, 2022 protests, it is important that these events, as we've discussed today, not be seen in isolation, but as part of a longer trend of human rights violations, some of which amount to atrocity crimes that has been the result of decades of impunity. I therefore want to reiterate the call by human rights experts and civil society groups that the Human Rights Council expands the mandate of the fact-finding mission to include the events that occurred in 1998, or alternatively that a separate UN Commission of Inquiry be established to investigate the crimes committed in 1998, uh, 1988 sorry, in order to document evidence that could be used in eventual trials. Now, I'm well aware of the challenges of implementing recommendations and bringing redress to the victims of the crimes committed, but however selective or limited the immediate results of justice for atrocity crimes might be perceived, the critical importance of these efforts for those affected, as well as their long-term impact as a deterrent of future atrocities must be recognized. We also know that seemingly symbolic gestures, and here I'm thinking, for example, of the ICC warrant for President Putin, not only sends a signal to perpetrators that the international community is taking note, um, but can also contribute to justice in small ways by, for example, limiting the freedom of movement of perpetrators even when they're heads of state. I'm also thinking of the fact that President Raisi canceled his trip to Geneva to speak at the Global Refugee Forum last December following calls for his arrest. In the same way, targeted sanctions can limit the freedoms enjoyed by known perpetrators, also those at lower levels. And here I want to just note that, um, and the previous speaker pointed this out today, while the, also, while the testimonies today have focused mainly on prominent individuals, uh, as perpetrators. Let us not forget those lower level officials who also need to be held accountable. So while traditional justice in the form of arrests and trials might seem like a long way off at this moment, there are other ways in which justice can be served. An increasing number of states are turning to universal jurisdiction, um, as the previous speaker elaborated. Beyond the UN, I think there are specific groups within national governments um, that can be approached. I'm thinking particularly of legislators um, who've taken the lead in past cases of putting atrocity crimes on the agendas of legislative bodies and, for example, calling for the recognition of gross human rights violations as constituting atrocity crimes like genocide. But for all of these measures, investigations and preferably UN-sanctioned investigations are necessary. So this should continue to be a point of priority. I also want to reiterate that from the perspective of transitional justice, criminal justice on its own is also an insufficient response to atrocities. Alongside justice, there needs to be a process that reveals the truth about what happened. And this also constitutes a basic right of victims and families. And this has all been affirmed by the statements that we've heard today. This involves both the public accounting of the magnitude of the crimes committed, with today's proceedings, I think, being part of this process, but also families of victims being told the truth about the fate of their loved ones. Truth-telling lays the first stone in the pillar of prevention of future crimes. Finally, we often think of justice as an accountability mechanism used to address events of the past. At the same time, however, judicial proceedings are important in terms of deterring future crimes and strengthening uh, potential reconciliation processes. In short, despite the challenges, if we want to not only achieve justice for past crimes, but prevent future violence and atrocities, 
we must continue to pursue justice and reject impunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, to Professor Karen Smith.